worshiping with us today. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We'll bow now for a word of prayer. Father God, thank you for waking us up this morning, allowing us to start a new day, a new week. We ask that your angels are always encamped around and about us and protecting us from any hurt, harm, or danger, and allow us to just learn from you today and apply these things to our lives. We ask all these blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we'll have a selection from our music ministry. Okay, if we let the praise begin this morning. Does anybody have a reason to give God some praise? We ask you to join in with us as we lift his name up. Amen.
Thank you, Praise Team, for that selection. Now we are, the atmosphere has been set. It is time for the word. Let us dive in. Now, when I was a kid back in the 80s, which seems like so long ago, but there were iconic TV commercials that it seems like everyone knew and remembered. Coca-Cola wanted to teach the world to sing in perfect harmony. There was a Mikey who normally hated everything, but when he tried Life Cereal, they yelled out, oh, he likes it. Mikey likes it. Dunkin' Donuts had Fred the Baker, who would wake up in the middle of the night when it was early, oh, it's time to go, time to make the donuts. Anybody over 40 is probably at home right now nodding along. They remember the commercials. And younger folks, if you haven't seen them before, after services, go to YouTube. You'll be able to find any of these old famous commercials. One of my favorites, though, was from Wendy's. And in this video, in this commercial, there are three older women that walk up and see this big, huge hamburger bun. But when they see the bun, one of the ladies yells out, where's the beef? Where is it? They see this huge bun, but in the process, you would expect that there'd be a big piece of hamburger along with this bun, but you didn't see that. It was just this big bun, and she's yelling out, where's the beef? The expectations didn't really line up. And sometimes as believers, we have the same issue where maybe the expectations don't match up either. Many of you are probably familiar with the story of Jesus entering the temple at the time when he was a little upset when he saw the things that were going on. They did not match his expectations. So I want you to picture this scene because a lot is going on right before this particular thing's happened. So Jesus had just made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. He's coming in, riding on the donkey. People are shouting, Hosanna, and worshiping him and laying down these palm branches. And that's where we get the concept of Palm Sunday from and celebrating that at the start of Holy Week. But after the parading, Jesus decided to go to the temple. He decided, oh, let me stop by the church. And when he did, he was in for such a surprise because those religious leaders that tried to act like they were so uh, holy and, and so righteous had allowed a lot of craziness to go on on the inside, even though it might have looked a different way on the outside. So Jesus thought he was just walking to the temple and had an expectation of what he should see. But when he opened the doors, he saw money changers. He saw people selling uh, doves and other animals and livestock, and they were doing these things in a way that wasn't being fair. They were probably cheating people out of the money, and he's seeing all this going on, and Jesus says, uh-uh, not here. You have turned this house of prayer into a den of thieves. He's turning over tables. Jesus is hot. He's upset because this is just does not line up with the expectation of what should have been going on in his father's house. These expectations didn't match. And then unfortunately, or maybe fortunately for us because we get to learn from it, the very next morning, Jesus runs into another situation. Very similarly, we had one expectation, but it didn't match up. So let's turn to Matthew chapter 21 and look at verses 18 and 19. This is about a fig tree that Jesus came up upon when he was hungry the next morning. Now in the morning, as he returned to the city, he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it but leaves and said to it, let no fruit grow on you ever again. Immediately, the fig tree withered away. So like the old Wendy's commercial, asking where's the beef? In essence, Jesus is saying, where's the fruit? Where is the fruit? I'm hungry. I've come up to this tree that's plush and full of leaves. But as he got closer, there was no fruit to help him in his time of need. Just for a little bit of background to understand about fig trees, once they have grown and, and produced all of these leaves, it takes about three years to get to the point of producing in that fashion. But once they've done that, there's a lot of fruit that's produced from in the early fall and in the springtime, twice a year, that a lot of fruit is produced. So it's thought that this took place in the springtime when Jesus came upon this fig tree. And in that moment, there's no reason, based on all that's been said, why there shouldn't have been any fruit there when Jesus came to this tree. It's full of leaves. It's the right time of year. There should be fruit, I'm hungry, that I am reaching for to actually receive. So when that didn't happen, Jesus cursed the tree. It withered. It died so that it couldn't deceive anyone else by having an appearance or looking like there will be fruit there. 
something that someone could glean from and learn from and help and apply, but then they're actually not being anything there. Sometimes things look a little different when you see them from afar off and it looks all good and shiny and you get close up and it may not be all that great. As they say, all that glitters isn't gold. Now, some people might hear me say that you see something that looks good from a distance and then you get closer and it's, it's not that good. You may think of other people or other things or experiences that you've had. But I would ask you to examine yourselves. I dare you to take a look in the mirror and ask yourself, where's the fruit? Are there moments where maybe you are that tree that looks plush and full from a distance, but upon closer examination, there may be fruit missing? Now, this fruit is the evidence of who we are in Christ. Genesis chapter 1 and verses 11 and 12 says that the tree produces fruit according to its own kind. We're made in God's image. So if we are a reflection of him being that we should be able to bear this same fruit that reflects him, who we are. It shows the spirit that's on the inside of us that can be shared with other people. Now, what is this fruit going to look like? The Bible gives us a place to look so we can find out exactly what it should be as we're bearing this fruit. So when someone asks, where's the fruit? We'll be able to show them these things. Let's take a look at Galatians chapter 5. And we're going to go 20, verses 22 through 25. And I'll be reading this passage from the New Living Translation. But when the Holy Spirit controls our lives, he will produce this kind of fruit in us. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Here there is no conflict with the law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. If we are living now by the Holy Spirit, let us follow the Holy Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. So when the Holy Spirit controls our lives, this is the fruit that will be produced in us, the fruit of the Spirit, these nine things that you've probably heard before, whether it was Sunday school, vacation Bible school, children's church, a regular Sunday morning worship. You've probably heard this before, and that is some kind of fruit. But we're not talking about nine different fruits. We're talking about the same Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit and these different nine attributes that are a part of the same thing. Sometimes in children's church, we would do an illustration with Starburst, where there'd be nine different flavors of Starburst, but it's all still the one same Starburst. So this is still the same spirit that's going to produce these nine characteristics in us. So they're all slices of the same fruit. And the same little old you, just your one self, is going to produce all of them as you allow the Holy Spirit to lead you. All of our other desires and passions were crucified with Christ on his cross and allows us, as our lives have changed, to walk in this way according to the Spirit. This is not something that we can do on our own power. Not at all. Not at all all. I know me, and you know you. So if you're being honest, you know you can't produce these things all by yourself. Where's the fruit when your patience is this thin, and somebody is already tap dancing on your last nerve? Where's the fruit at that point? Where's the fruit when there's madness all around you, and you want to react with rage, but the Spirit desires you to react with peace? Where is the fruit Where's the fruit when you're tempted to do something, but now you have to apply self-control? These are not situations that we can handle by ourselves. We have to rely on the Holy Spirit. And you're deceiving yourself if you think you can produce all of those fruits, all those parts of the fruit on your own. Forget about it. Just let it go. Let it go. So how is it that we can do this as we rely on the Holy Spirit's leading? Let's turn to John chapter 15 and look at verses one through five, and then later on, we'll, we'll stay here and come down to some more verses. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. 
as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. We're just branches that are no good unless we are connected to the vine. When we abide in him, we can produce much fruit, as the word just told us. But it comes from abiding in him. And the word abide means to stay, to wait, to remain connected to him. Just in this passage alone, in the beginning of John chapter 15, abide is mentioned 10 times. So it must be important. Abiding in him is staying connected. And we can't overlook the fact that in this passage, it also mentions being pruned, being clean, so that we can become more productive. More productive. And let me give this sidebar. Being productive isn't the same thing as being busy. And some people think that they, that they are. But being productive produces results. While busyness tends to look like you're just doing something. You're just moving around and got your hands on a whole lot of things, but it's not producing anything. You're just doing a whole lot. That sounds similar to that fig tree, doesn't it? It looks good from the outside, but at closer examination, there's really no fruit. We have to be careful of that as believers. There's a story uh, in the Word where it speaks of sisters, Martha and Mary, and they had invited Jesus to their home. And as Jesus and the disciples are there, Martha is moving around uh, in, inside the home and getting, you know, probably doing chores, tidying up. You got Jesus coming by and the disciples. So she's fixing things up, probably preparing a meal and whatever their favorites may be. And as she's just tending to the house, she looks at Martha, who is sitting at the feet of Jesus, abiding in him in that moment. And Martha gets a little upset because she feels like she's the only one working. She's the only one busy. And you know what, Martha? You're probably right. You were the only one busy, but maybe you weren't being productive in that moment. And she has the audacity to say to Jesus, tell Martha to tell Mary to help me. I'm doing all of this stuff preparing for you all getting ready, and Mary's not doing anything. And Jesus' response probably wasn't what Martha thought he would say. But he said that Mary had chosen the better thing. What Mary had done in just sitting with Jesus, learning from him, and abiding in him, that was the more productive thing. That was the better thing. She had chosen the best part. We have to keep in mind that just because you're moving around doing a whole lot of stuff does not mean you're being productive. We're called to produce this fruit, to bear this fruit. That doesn't mean you got to have your hand in all kind of things going on just to be productive. At some point, you got to find a way to abide in him, to learn and grow from him. I heard um, a leader mention in a podcast about you, can, you have to make time for him. You can always make time. You don't have to make time for noise. Noise is going to come. You have to make this time to abide in him. You have to make that time. So make it happen. Push some of those things to the side. Recognize what your priorities are and what the most important things in your life really is. And that's that relationship that we have with Jesus Christ. So abiding in him allows us to be more fruitful. And if you really think about it, when you're just busy moving around, hands in so many different things, think about how frustrated you get. Especially when you look and you see other people doing stuff and you're not able to do it. Maybe you're just doing too much. Maybe you're doing too much. And maybe it isn't the best thing. You need to reach back and make sure you understand how important it is to abide in him so you can produce much more fruit. If we don't abide in him or stay close to him, we can't bear this fruit. And the fruit that we do have will start to go bad because it's not connected to the vine. I've heard uh, bishops say that the farther that you get out of town, that radio signal goes bad. You don't hear things nearly as clearly because you're no longer close to whatever that tower is. So think about that uh, in the spiritual. If you're not close to the father as you should be, you're not going to hear from him clearly. So don't forget to abide in him and how important that is in order for us to bear much more fruit. Let's go back to John chapter 15 and take a look at verses 6 through 8. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire, 
and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this, my father is glorified that you bear much fruit. So you will be my disciples. If we don't abide in him, we're going to be cast away. That branch is going to wither. It won't produce fruit, and it serves no benefit to the remainder of the plant, none at all. Some of you at home may have house plants and things you recognize that, oh, this leaf is turning brown, this steam is rotted. Well, I need to remove that. I need to pull it away because in that moment, those dead leaves are actually pulling nutrients away from the healthy part of the plant. So those things that aren't bearing fruit are going to be pulled and cast away. The word here says that God will cut off the unproductive branches and cast them to the side. But he will also prune and cut back the branches that, to help promote growth or more development or more fruit. So let's all pray to know the difference between things in our lives that need to be cut back and things that need to be cut off. Verse 8 says that God is glorified when we bear much fruit. So we will be his disciples. They'll know us, his disciples, by the fruit that we actually bear, the fruit that we are producing. His disciples are going to produce fruit that is identifiable, so folks are going to know exactly where that fruit came from. This fruit reflects the vine that it's connected to. So let's turn and take a look at uh, the fruit that's produced in Matthew chapter 7 and going to verses 16 through 20. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. You will know them by their fruit. And remember that someone is saying the same thing about you. You are someone else's them. So as you're thinking, yep, I'll know them by their fruit. But just remember that you are someone else's them. They're saying the same thing about you. What fruit do they see? Where's the fruit when someone is examining you? Genesis chapter 111 again says, a tree yields fruit according to its kind. A good tree is going to bear good fruit. And a bad tree is going to bear bad fruit. In everyday life, nobody likes bad fruit. Those are the ones that you pick by. When you're in the grocery store, that bad fruit might have spots on it. It might be soft or rotted. It might have fruit flies flying around. Everybody's picking around this bad fruit. Nobody wants it. It's going to be cast aside eventually. Smelly, moldy, nobody wants that. So just imagine spiritually what that might look like if someone is producing bad fruit because they're separated from the vine. The attitude might stink. They may have rotten thoughts or rotten thinking. They might even have flies too, who knows. But in this moment, this bad fruit, nobody wants that. Everyone wants to get away from it. Nobody wants that to be reproduced anywhere near them. At least the good fruit we understand is gonna have seeds that can allow those seeds to be planted and replenish and regenerate to help someone else be similar to us. Think of the fruit of the spirit that we can share with others and those seeds can allow them to be reproduced. That bad fruit is not going to have the ability to do that. It's not going to have the ability to do that. So as you think back to the grocery store for a moment, that section where the fruit is is called the produce section. All those items are filled with these seeds that can produce more fruit. More fruit. These things are perishable. And what you see today might be replaced by something else tomorrow that makes it more fresh. And the Holy Spirit will help us to produce fresh fruit for what we're dealing with today. His mercies are new every morning. Today's situation might be too much for yesterday's joy or yesterday's uh, peace. We need freshness. We need newness daily. As the word says, give us this day our daily bread. That Holy Spirit will allow us to, you, to, to give us what we need today to make it through. Because again, yesterday's might not be enough. You might have been great in a situation where you were able to demonstrate patience yesterday. But today, they said the right thing, and it just does not feel the same. Well, the Holy Spirit is there to help us 
He's there to help us to produce the fruit that we need for the current situation that we're in currently. So don't forget him. You cannot produce these fruits on your own. You have to rely on him. So when something pushes you the wrong way and you don't feel good about it or whatever the situation may be, recognize that it's not you that needs to respond anyway. You need to rely on the power of the Holy Spirit on the inside of you and the fruit that it bears to respond to these situations. I want to leave you with a prayer that the Apostle Paul shared with the Colossian church that still encourages us today. So we're going to take a look at Colossians chapter 1, verses 3 through 6, and then skip down to verses 9 and 10. We give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints, because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which has come to you as it is also in all the world and is bringing forth fruit as it is also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth. Verse 9, for this reason we also, since the day we heard of it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. So let's be fruitful in every good work as we abide in the vine. Because apart from him, we can't do anything. As long as you stay connected and rely on the Holy Spirit to produce the fruit on the inside of us, no one can look at us and say, where's the fruit? Because they'll immediately see that when they come in contact with us. They'll know that something's a little bit different. And it's because of us abiding with the true vine. It's our opportunity as we live to allow our fruit to be an advertisement, similar to the commercials that I mentioned earlier that show them exactly what the Holy Spirit does for us and will do for them. But we have the opportunity to show that by displaying the fruit. So let's not forget the fruit of the Spirit that's been shared with us in Galatians and allows us to apply it to our lives so that it can develop seeds and pour into other people and continue to produce more fruit. I hope that something was said today that spoke to your heart and will allow you to remember to stay connected to the true vine. Be blessed. All right, light of life. Can anyone tell me what time it is? It's giving time. Hallelujah. Come on, put your hands together one time. Let me see you move. Come on. It's the season for the favor of the Lord. Say. It's the season for the favor of the Lord. It's the season for Thank you for your tithes, gifts, and offerings. Your faithfulness allows us to continue to move forward as a ministry. Well, family, we thank you so much for tuning in today and hope that something was said that you can apply to your life as you move forward throughout this week. Make sure that your fruit is on full display. Remember this. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me should not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Be blessed. Carry on The light of light is shining on The dark of night can overcome